We often hear the claim that the pre-tribulation rapture is a new doctrine. People make absurd statements like, there was no rapture teaching prior to the 1800s, or John Darby invented the pre-tribulation rapture, and he invented it around 1830. Folks, there is absolutely no truth whatsoever in these statements. The pre-tribulation rapture is an ancient teaching that has been held since the earliest days of the church. And that's what we're going to look at today. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Lee Brainerd. Welcome to Soothkeep and another edition of Prophecy in the Crucible. My mission is truth, especially truth in the prophetic arena. Truth at any cost, truth above every other consideration. Last year, as some of you may recall, I discovered 10 crystal clear pre-tribulation rapture passages in the Greek writings of Ephraim the Syrian. These were rapture passages that were unknown previously to the dispensational world and to those that love prophecy. Well, and, and that's made been quite a stir, to be honest, in the church. Well, now this year I've uncovered some more clear rapture passages, this time in the Greek writings of Eusebius, and we're going to examine them today. The first one is found in the Fragments of Luke. It's a comment on chapter 18, verse 8, and it's found in Mean, volume 24, page 588. The saying, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth, reveals a lapse of faith. When no faithful man shall be found, or perhaps somewhere a few scarce ones, in the time of his second theophany will be found. For the world shall meet with a great test in the season of apostasy, in which the faithful man will scarcely be found. Suddenly there shall not even be one because some have been taken and the others left behind, delivered to the eagles. In this way there shall be a lapse of faith among mankind. Thereafter he shall take revenge for his saints which have been killed by the ungodly." Now I want you to notice the order here. There's a sudden disappearance of the church. It says some are taken, others are left. And notice that, that this is followed by the lapse of faith. In fact, it says in this way the lapse of faith happens. In fact, I'll just read this here exactly as it says. In this way there shall be a lapse of faith. So the lapse of faith is introduced after the church is taken out of the world. When some are taken and the others are left. And then notice it says, thereafter he shall take revenge for his saints which had been killed by the ungodly. So this is the order. The rapture comes first. There's going to be one taken and uh, some are going to be taken and others are going to be left. Then there's the tribulation, which he calls the season of apostasy and which he also calls the time of the lapse of faith. And then He's going to have the time of judgment or the time of revenge for his saints. You just can't get around it. This passage in Eusebius has the rapture happening prior to the season of apostasy under the Antichrist. Well, let's move on to the second one. And this is also in the fragments of Luke, and it's a comment on Luke 17, verses 26 and following. This is found in Mean, uh, Book 24, pages 584 through 585. As all perish then, except those gathered with Noah in the ark, so also at his coming, the ungodly in the season of apostasy shall perish. While, according to the pattern of Noah, all the righteous and godly are to be separated from the ungodly and gathered into the heavenly ark of God. 
For in this way comes the time when not even one righteous man will be found any more among mankind. And when all the ungodly have been made atheists by the Antichrist, and the whole world is overcome by apostasy, the wrath of God shall come upon the ungodly. Notice the order once again. The righteous are gathered into the heavenly ark. Then there's a season of apostasy that follows when not one righteous man is going to be found or at most a scarce one. And then the ungodly are going to be made atheists by the Antichrist. And then the wrath of God shall come upon the ungodly. Now his terminology is a little different than ours. We talk about the rapture. He talks about the gathering into the heavenly ark. We talk about the tribulation. He talks about the time of apostasy and the Antichrist. We talk about the second coming, and he talks about the wrath of God coming upon the ungodly. Now, there's no way around it. This is making a distinction between the rapture and the second coming. And sandwiched between the rapture and the second coming is the time of apostasy and the Antichrist. Now, the third passage is found in the fragments of Eusebius and Daniel, fragment Epsilon, which is in Mean, volume 24, page 528. The Apostle Paul was moved to write in this manner on the second coming of Christ. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the command, with the call of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and so forth. But the same apostle also set forth in order in his prophetic writings the end times coming of Antichrist and his depravity, and after this, the glorious appearing of our Savior. Now notice the order. He's got the descent of the Lord for the rapture. Then he has the coming of the Antichrist. And then he has a glorious public appearing. This is the order that you see everywhere in Eusebius' prophetic passages. Notice the clear distinction between the rapture and the second coming with the Antichrist sandwiched in between. Now notice the phrase, set forth in order. In Greek, this is the adverb akaluthos, which translates in order or consecutively. And if you need to look this word up, look it up in Lamp's patristic lexicon. This word implies that the rapture, the Antichrist, and the glorious appearance are going to happen one after the other or in consecutive order. He's got another passage very similar to this one in the fragments of his demonstration on the gospel, which is going to be in book five and fragment five. Well, let's move on to the fourth passage. This is in his commentary on the Psalms. It's in the 75th Psalm. Well, actually, if you're reading the Septuagint, it's going to be in the 74th Psalm. It's found in Mean, Volume 23, page 876. Then they shall be exalted when they shall reign with their own king, according to the apostle who said, For the firstfruits is Christ, then those who are Christ in his parousia, then the end, when he shall deliver the kingdom to his God and Father, when he shall destroy all authority and power, when the righteous shall drink the cup of immortal life. Here, now notice the order. It's Christ the first fruits, then the parousia, when he gathers the church, and then the end. Now, this is not merely quoting scripture, because some of you are going to recognize that he's quoting a scripture here. He's making an application of scripture, and he's making a very specific application of scripture. What you have to understand, what has to be clarified, is that he is distinguishing the rapture and the second coming. The proof of this is the fact that Eusebius is an amillennialist. In other words, he doesn't believe in a literal thousand-year kingdom. 
So he doesn't believe in the second coming followed by a thousand years, followed by the judgment of all the ungodly at the end. He's an amillennialist. There is no literal future millennium. So all you have is the second coming. And at the second coming, there's a general resurrection of all the dead. And that's when the ungodly are judged. Folks, this is a very clear distinction between the rapture and the second coming. What he says here absolutely necessitates a distinction between the rapture and the second coming. You cannot have the Lord coming for his saints, followed by the end when he establishes his kingdom and judges the ungodly. You can't have a separation between them without having a separation between the rapture and the second coming. Well, let's move on to the fifth passage, which is his Eclogai Propheticai, or other words known as the General Elementary Introduction. And this is found on pages 132 and 133 in the Geisford edition of this work of Eusebius. The passage says, When he has finished his spiritual temple of rational and soulish stones, that is, the church, the Lord himself shall come, even the word of God, and with him the angel of the covenant to the manifested temple. Then, for announcing the things of his second coming, the word says to sinners, Behold, the Lord Almighty comes, and who shall endure the day of his entrance? Who shall stand at his appearance? Now, notice the order. First, the Lord comes to his completed temple. And then, then, in other words, after that, the Lord foreannounces his second coming. If you're foreannouncing something, it hasn't happened yet. It's still in the future. So here we have the rapture, and then he foreannounces the yet future second coming. Folks, this is a crystal clear distinction between the rapture and the second coming. There's no way around it. Well, let's move on to the sixth passage. And this is found in Eusebius's commentary in Isaiah in book two in section 24. Many sons born by God, I shall gather into my heavenly city, taking them up flying them through the air, lofted like birds on the, on the winds. I am talking about angelic powers. Some of them I shall gather to myself from the north, others from Africa, or as some say, from the south. Notice, this can't be the second coming. It's impossible for this to be a reference to the second coming. Any rapture where you go up to the clouds at the second coming is going to involve those saints coming immediately back down to earth. This here has the saints going not just to the clouds and staying there. This has them going all the way to the heavenly Jerusalem. And they're going to stay there. Folks, this is a rapture that precedes the second coming. And this is the exact same spirit that we see in John chapter 14 verses 1 through 3. And we know from the passages that we just looked at, the preceding passages, we know that this rapture to the new Jerusalem precedes the time of tribulation under the Antichrist. It precedes the time of apostasy under the Antichrist. And it even more precedes the second coming. Well, let's look at the seventh and final passage. This is also found in the commentary in Isaiah. It's in book two, and it's in section 58. In the season of the end, God shall bring them, that is the church, to the city of God, even the heavenly Jerusalem, and prosper them with this supreme boon or supreme blessing, when he shall take them up like he did with Elijah, carrying them upon angelic chariots, bathing them in heavenly light. Notice once again, just like the previous passage, this is in the same spirit as John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. This can't be the second coming because the, the church doesn't stay down here on earth. This can't be the second coming because 
The church doesn't go up to the clouds and come immediately back down. This has to be a rapture that precedes the second coming because the saints are going, the church is going to heaven to stay there. So in conclusion, we've looked at seven clear pre-tribulation rapture passages in Eusebius. And I'm very glad that the Lord has enabled me to present these to the prophecy-loving public, and may God use them for His glory. Now, gainsayers are going to look at these passages, and they're going to come up with any kind of empty straw to pretend that these are not pre-tribulation rapture passages. And they're going to deny that Eusebius said what he said and meant what he appears to mean. But for those who love the truth for its own sake, and they're not going to come to these passages with a hardcore doctrinal bone to pick or a hardcore hobby horse to ride, they're going to be forced to conclude, wow, he really did make a distinction between the rapture and the second coming, and he's got the tribulation pre uh, sandwiched between the two, just like modern dispensationalists. And the only difference is we've got a, a very consistent terminology we use, and he uses... Uh, a broader set of terminology. Folks, we have one more proof here that the pre-tribulation rapture is not a recent invention. We've, we've presented seven crystal clear passages which prove that Eusebius taught a pre-tribulation rapture in the late third and early fourth centuries. This is, you can't escape this. This is as clear as the noonday sun. Well, this brings us to the end of our presentation today. May God bless this. May he use it mightily in the defense of the pre-tribulation rapture. Eyes wide open, brain engaged, heart on fire. See you next time.